very important announcement before we begin the video. I have new merch. I have these insanely gorgeous tarot card inspired designs featuring me and my cats. You can get them on black or white t-shirts on posters. You can even get these full-size wall tapestries of them. I am so in love with these. I think they might be my favorite merch that I've ever made. If you also appreciate them, you can check them out in the description or on the merch shelf down below. Tis the season, my friends. The bone octopus has emerged from my storage. So a few months ago now, somebody suggested in my Patreon Discord server that I do a video about classic creepypastas, and I was immediately like, oh my god, yes. Like, one of the examples they listed was Lavender Town, and just Hearing the name Lavender Town after like 10 years was enough for me to be like, yeah. Oh my God. Originally I had thought, okay, so I'll do like, I'll do a reading of some of these classic nostalgic creepypastas. Then I discovered that that is already like a whole genre of YouTube content and many people have far better dramatic narration voices than I do. So then I thought, okay, never mind. I will have to think of something else to say about creepypastas. And actually I'm very glad for that because I think that just reading like the most famous stories associated with each of these creepypastas does not capture what I find so interesting about them. Because when your medium of storytelling is the internet, it opens up the potential for anyone to participate, to start adding details or making their own iterations of the thing. The reason that a lot of creepypastas are so iconic is because they turned into like these internet wide improv games of different people adding their own photos and videos and recordings and anecdotes. And that's why creepypastas have, I think rightfully, been called a modern example of folklore. That's not to say that all creepypastas are good or effectively scary. They're not. They're very casually written. Like, these are not published or publishable stories by any means. Probably the second most well-known creepypasta ever, second only to Slenderman. Um, I, would, I would say it's Jeff the Killer. Um, that one's not very good. I think a lot of people enjoy Jeff the Killer for the same reason that they enjoy My Immortal. It's creepypastas like that which have earned the title crappy pastas. Some like Jeff the Killer are just not very well written or very clearly written by people who are very young. Um, some some crappy pastas are outright parodies of the genre. Man and girl go out to drive under moonlight. They stop at on at sign of road. He turned to his girl and say, "Baby, I love you very much." What is it, honey? Our car is broken down. I think the engine is broken. I'll walk and get some more fuel. Okay, I'll stay here and look after our stereo. There have been news reports of stereos being stolen. Good idea. Keep the doors locked no matter what. I love you, sweaty. So the guy left to get full for the car? After two hours, the girl say, where is my baby? He was supposed to be back by now. Then the girl hear a scratching sound and a voice say, let me in. The girl doesn't do it. And after a while, she goes to sleep. The next morning, she wakes up and finds her boyfriend still not there. She gets out to check and man door hand hook car door. You know, kind of poking fun at these like, cliche urban legend tropes. And maybe man door hand hook car door has been like what your perception of creepypastas is, but that is not the case. Um, some of them are very effective, very scary, especially for kids. But before we delve any deeper into that, I do have to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor, Audible. I know for a fact that you guys enjoy sitting back and listening to a good story because you're here, the two hour long videos about 20 year old fanfiction drama channel. And that is why I am excited to tell you that Audible offers an incredible selection of audio content, audiobooks, podcasts, original series across every genre you can imagine. I personally go for the escapism route. I listen to a lot of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I'm currently listening to All Systems Read by Martha Wells. I have been meaning to get around to this one forever. And the great thing about audiobooks is that I can listen while I'm multitasking. Just having that Audible app on my phone means that I can listen anytime, anywhere. An Audible membership also gives you access to a huge selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and original series that are now included within the membership. So remember to visit audible.com slash strangeons or text strangeons to 500-500 to start listening today. Resume regularly scheduled content. I think the people who have the strongest reaction to the idea of creepypastas is people who are around my age or maybe even a little bit younger than me. Because in the creepy we passed a golden age of like 2008 to 2010. We were at that prime age of around 9 to 12-ish where you might have unsupervised internet access, but you also still have this squishy, susceptible child brain. You lack the discernment and online savvy to know for sure that these stories are fake. You very easily get a little worm in your brain going, but what if the Lavender Town frequencies really do drive me insane? And you sit there in social studies class like, I listened to it. When I think about Lavender Town, I do not think about the 
the original post that is associated with. I remember my friend telling me all about it, and then we were like looking it up on the school computer, and we were looking on YouTube trying to find the correct the correct video with the music. And you know, it's hard to find the correct one. You gotta find the correct one with the real secret frequencies that only children can hear. And you have to listen to it with headphones and that way it's the most effective. And I remember we plugged her like corded headphones in and I had one earbud and I, she, it was playing and I had one earbud and I was just like, ah! So the original story of Lavender Town Syndrome goes that after the release of Pokemon Red and Green in Japan in 1996, children who reached Lavender Town suffered severe mental and physical reactions to it. 200 of them went insane and committed suicide. This was apparently the result of the music's very high frequencies, frequencies so high that only children could hear them. The music was then altered for later iterations of the game and children were no longer adversely affected by it. Of course, many videos have surfaced over the years claiming to be able to recreate or to be the original Lavender Town music. And that is what is so interesting about creepypastas, the way that they travel and grow and blur these lines between online and real life and fiction and reality. So the word creepypasta is derived from the word copypasta, which is derived from the phrase copying and pasting. Back in ye olde internet and e even in certain internet circles today, it is used to describe like a text-based meme that is copied and pasted. If you're familiar with Tumblr or some of my Tumblr content, John Green Cock monologue, that's a copy pasta. People will copy and paste that paragraph of text in a situation where it seems comical as a response. So a creepy pasta is a story that is copied and pasted and repeated throughout the internet in a similar way. Like I said, the golden age of creepy pastas was I would say 2008 to 2010. There are some that predate that, there are some that come after that, but I would say a lot of the most iconic ones originate from 2008 to 2010. In most cases, we can pinpoint exactly how creepypastas began, and we have at least a username attached to the original creator. However, the nature of the internet is that these things very quickly escape the hands of their original creators. Everyone is invited to participate, to write their own spin-off stories, to create videos or images to bolster those written stories, or the other way around, to, to write stories based on creepy images that they find online. This is how we get these modern monsters like Slenderman, the Rake, Eyeless Jack. There are countless stories of encounters with these monsters online, images and videos that people have captured. Many creepypastas, even if they are not intended as ARGs, are ARG-like in structure, the way that you can scour the internet looking for different facets of them or different pieces of evidence. So the way that creepypastas are created are very reminiscent of folkloric traditions of the past, but can they really be called folklore? I have consulted the scholars about this. I have, as usual with my videos that involve research, my brick of texts. So folklorists define folklore by a few key characteristics. Number one, it is communicated informally. It is passed from one person to the next orally. Two, the telling of folklore is a performance. It is a creative action. It is not written and edited by an author for mass consumption at some later date. It involves the real-time interaction between listener and speaker. Number three, it is variable. Each storyteller adds their own little details and embellishments. A folktale is a dynamic living thing that to some degree takes on the personality of every unique storyteller. Most media that we consume today are static objects, a book, a movie, a TV show that never changes. Yes, your perception of this can get a little skewed if you consume a lot of fan fiction or spend a lot of time in online fandom spaces. However, those things still have very concrete origins. They have a fixed canon, whether you feel like adhering to it or not. Whereas a folktale has no definite origin, it has no owner. But the internet cannot possibly give rise to folklore then because the internet is not a real place. There is no tangible person-to-person -person oral communication happening. At least that's what an older generation of folklorists seem to have thought but they also thought their field of study was dying out. Which seems unlikely, given that the co-creation of folklore is like a fundamental human thing. It will always happen. So if we stick to the oldest, stingiest definitions of folklore, yes, that is going to exclude the internet. But are we gonna gain anything from doing that? It seems obvious to me, to us, assuming that most of my audience is kind of within my age range, um, we are the generation that grew up on the internet. And it seems obvious that websites very much are places with cultures. A quote that I really liked from one of the articles that I read, um, it was written by Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet in 1998. The electronic vernacular is neither speech nor writing as we have known it, but something in between. And increasingly with the convergence of technologies, it is multimedia. Online communication isn't exactly speech in that it isn't literally spoken in real time, but it isn't writing in that it isn't formal or edited. It's definitely something that is 
personal and informal enough to be considered capable of transmitting folklore. Creepypasta stories and characters are developed in the exact same creative, casual way that vampire stories spread all over the world hundreds of years ago. Or more recent urban legends like Bloody Mary or the, the hook one that manhand hook car door is making fun of. The conclusion that many scholars have come to is that creepypasta is like turbocharged folklore. Traditional creatures of folklore may have taken decades or even generations to take hold of local communities, to feel like they had always been there. Creepypastas can achieve the same thing in weeks or months because of the sheer speed and scope of online communication. The anonymity of the internet lends itself to that as well, because people tend to be more unfiltered, more creative and weird when they're anonymous. A very big point of contention for people who are invested in these debates about whether creepypasta can be considered folklore is that we know the definite origins of a lot of creepypastas. We know exactly when Slender Man originated on the Something Awful forums in July of 2009. We do not know how Bloody Mary originated. We do not know how Baba Yaga originated. The kind of magic of these things is that over time, as these stories are transmitted, the origins eventually become lost, and then they feel like they, they feel like they really do have a life of their own. Creepypastas absolutely gain that life of their own and that belonging to a whole community as well, but they move so fast that their origins are not lost. With creepypastas, we can see that process of creation in public time-stamped posts. And for some people, they, they lack that magic. They're not very interesting because there's no mystery around them, really. Whereas others see this as an extremely interesting opportunity to study the process of folklore creation. Bringing folkloric ideas into the real world, acting out these stories in the real world, is what a big brain academia people call ostention. Catch me practicing ostention with the dudes in the computer lab in 2009. In the case of online folklore like creepypastas though, they also use the term reverse ostention, meaning that people's real life acts of creation also feed into building the story. Someone searches for cryptid images that might be of the rake and posts them to a Reddit thread about it. Someone creates an actual game based off the sonic.exe story. The people consuming creepypastas were often also the same people who were creating those stories at the same time. Yes, you probably don't literally believe in Slender Man if you're photoshopping pictures of him yourself. But does that stop you from being spooked if you're doing it alone in the dark at night? You still get spooked by horror movies sometimes, even if you know they're not real. Because the fear, the emotions that those things create are real. Historically, most people spreading folklore probably didn't literally believe in vampires or Baba Yaga either when they were telling stories to scare other people. It's about the fundamental human urge. It's about the urge, okay? I think it is being proven time and time again that, that creepypastas are still extremely fun and extremely scary and meaningful to people, even if their origins are documented on the internet. Now I want to discuss a little bit more about the subject matter of a lot of creepypastas. Yes, there are some of them that go for the classic Oh, there's a scary guy and he's in the woods or lurking at the foot of your bed. Like Slender Man or The Rake or even, I guess, Jeff the Killer is meant to be an origin story for this, like, creepy, disfigured serial killer guy. There are the science gone wrong ones, like uh, Gateway of the Mind, where they remove all of this guy's senses so that he can perceive God. There's Russian Sleep Experiment. I swear I thought Russian Sleep Experiment was real until, like, two years ago. Raise your hand if you were a teen who liked edgy, spooky, dark facts, maybe followed six pence on Tumblr, and you are literally just now learning that uh, Russian Sleep Experiment was a creepypasta, because I know there's gotta be like two of you, at least. Anyway, so a lot of creepypastas draw on very established horror tropes, serial killers, monsters, horrific oopsies of science, but one thing creepypastas feature a lot of, which really stands out to me, is haunted technology. Games possessed by ghosts or demons, images and videos that can drive you insane. Because creepypastas are not told to freak people out who are sitting around a campfire in the woods at night. They're told to freak people out who are alone on the computer at night. A lot of the time it's haunted or evil children's media specifically. Obviously it's a very old horror trope to, to twist children's things into something sinister. It's shocking to us to see these things that we find comforting and nostalgic and safe to be ripped away and turned into something dangerous. Especially if you are still a kid encountering creepypastas unsupervised online the way a lot of us were. Lavender Town is one of the examples of that. There's Ben Drowned. This story eventually developed into a whole elaborate ARG that eventually concluded in 2020. 
However, it started out in 2009 as a series of 4chan posts detailing how the narrator had bought a haunted copy of Majora's Mask at a garage sale. The game at first appeared normal, but became increasingly glitchy and unsettling as it was possessed by the spirit of a 12-year-old boy named Ben who had drowned. The creator of Ben Drowned posted these videos of the game going wrong, of Ben tormenting him in it. It's considered a really well-done creepypasta that is very effective at disturbing people who consider this game comforting and nostalgic. <laughs> Another haunted game one is Sonic.exe. This guy gets a Sonic game mailed to him by his friend, who he just mysteriously hasn't seen in two weeks for some reason. Turns out the game is possessed by a demonic version of Sonic who stalks and kills the other characters, and then eventually steals the soul of the player. An actual game was later made that mimics the description of the game given in the original story. Username 666. Apparently, if you go to youtube.com slash 666, so the username or the channel would be 666, and you refresh the page multiple times, it will devolve into this horrible, melting, evil page that will kill you, drive you insane, unclear. Momo. This is a photograph of a real monster called Momo, not a sculpture by a Japanese artist. You can contact Momo if you text certain mysterious numbers on WhatsApp. Chanting into a mirror in a dark bathroom? Okay, grandma, I'm texting Momo right now. There was briefly like a Momo challenge where kids would text these numbers. Apparently, if you did get in contact with Momo, her thing was that she would eventually convince you to kill yourself. Smile Dog or Smile.jpg. It's this dark photo of a dog with this uncanny grin of human teeth. There's a few versions of the photo which are like varying levels of disturbing or detailed. None of these photos are the original Smile.jpg image though. They can only be approximations of what the original might have looked like because none of them seem to have the effect that the original did. It is said to have been a real photo of a demon which induced seizures, nightmares, and insanity until people eventually relented, gave in to what the smile dog wanted, which was for them to spread the image onto more people. Mariana Mortegard Gleskov. It's this blurry red YouTube video of this man staring into the camera as unsettling music gets louder and louder, and then at the end his face distorts into this horrible expression. The full video apparently drove a YouTube employee who saw it insane. YouTube cracks down very harshly on attempted uploads of the full video because they know how dangerous it is. Mr. Mix. Mr. Mix was a 90s PC game where you like cook with a chef by typing commands for him to put ingredients into a bowl. But the game was kind of torturous to young players because it gets very, very difficult very quickly. Level 5 already required you to type 500 words per minute, which is physically impossible for anyone to do. The soundtrack featured very unsettling music and dead silence alternately. Children who played it were disturbed by it. They did not like the game. They had nightmares in which they saw Mr. Mix. And because nobody really liked the game, it eventually faded into obscurity. Until a few years later, when a few people got their hands on a copy of the game and hacked it so that they could see what was in the unplayable later levels. The fifth level contained things like gory photos, which crashed their computers when they attempted to delete them. Once they reached the sixth level, however, they could not even describe what they had seen. The group of hackers became increasingly withdrawn, lost the ability to speak, and then disappeared. All remaining copies of the game were destroyed. Two years after that, one of the hackers was identified, disheveled and wearing a chef's hat, attempting to abduct a child from a grocery store, seeming to have become this predatory figure of Mr. Mix the chef. The Spongebob bootleg episode. A corrupted bootleg tape of a Spongebob episode was apparently found in a trash can in an abandoned mental hospital. The tape was damaged to the extent that it only contained static and this frame. It is said that if you look at it long enough, you may see Spongebob blink. Mario. All caps, usually spaces between the letters. This was a hacked game that was posted to a forum specifically dedicated to hacked Mario games. It was not a story about a hacked game. It was actually a creepy hacked game. It contained things like levels with no music, no enemies to avoid, just Mario. There were messages like, I hate you and never come back. The most significant was titled Victim Number One and seemed to be a description of a murder scene. The game ended by sending the player into a blank void from which they could not escape. It was discussed and dissected by members of the forum who found this terrifying image hidden inside of it, which they believed to be Victim Number One. Suicide Mouse. It starts off as a simple looped animation of Mickey Mouse walking along a street. It's one of the unreleased animations created by Walt Disney himself in the 1930s. 
However, when it was digitized recently, it was found that the animation actually cuts to black for several minutes before resuming, only this time the animation becomes increasingly distorted, unsettling sounds begin to play and increase in volume until they are blood-curdling screams, the background warps and melts and Mickey's face does this. Uh, he's looking a little Jeff the Killer, to be honest. The final frame is a piece of Russian text that translates to the sights of hell bring its viewers back in. The sight of the video drove a Disney employee to immediately grab a security guard's gun and kill himself. <laughs> We're noticed there's a, there's a bit of a pattern here with a lot of these. Dead Bart. This is a Lost Simpsons episode in which Bart dies uh, by being sucked out of the window of an airplane. When his family visits his grave, the shot pans out revealing the graveyard. And all of the graves feature names of celebrity guests who have been on The Simpsons. The death dates are correct, even for celebrities like Michael Jackson, who had not died at the time that that episode was created, and presumably also correct for those who will die in the future. Squidward's suicide. Someone who used to be an internet Nickelodeon described seeing an extremely disturbing episode called Squidward's suicide. It contained gory images of apparently real murders, disturbing sounds, demonic faces of the characters, just, was just all around extremely disturbing. Distorted portions of the tape surfaced online, the most well-known being Red Mist. Obviously, there, there are no corpses in this video because it's on YouTube, but it's supposedly a fragment of the real Lost episode, which was the creation of a bitter ex-animator turned serial killer named Andrew Skinner. That's a great name for a serial killer, by the way. If your name is Skinner, you gotta skin people. There are supposedly other lost tapes containing footage of Skinner's other victims, as well as his other spiteful distortions of the SpongeBob canon. So pretty much all creepypastas rely on images or videos. Even though we know that pretty much every image that we see online is altered in some way, people still instinctively see photography as something that represents reality. We have all taken a photo and instantly seen reality reflected there, experienced the camera as an objective machine. So we have this subconscious perception of photography as something that depicts reality, as something that is more convincing than just text on a page, even though we know that isn't the case at all anymore. Supernatural hoaxes have utilized photography pretty much as long as photo editing has existed, and photo editing has existed pretty much as long as photography has existed. Just look at Victorian spirit photography, the Cottingley fairies, iconic cryptid images like the Bigfoot one and the Loch Ness Monster one. The Blair Witch Project, the film that originated the horror found footage genre, was earth shattering. People had never seen that before. A film that was framed as nonfiction then devolving into supernatural horror. And a lot of people thought it was real. Ghost hunting shows still use pseudoscience like the spirit boxes and heat sensors, because even if we know logically that something is fake, if we can apparently see and hear it ourselves, it still affects us. Creepypastas almost take that very fact and turn it against us. If this image scares you, that's what it wants. Now it has a hold on you. If you listen to this song, if you play this game, a lost video can contain horrors that will change you forever. The images themselves are the monsters. Folklore is always a mirror of the society and the culture that it comes from. Monsters do still live in the woods sometimes, yes, but they also live in the internet. Games with demons in them, YouTube videos that will kill you if you watch them, a monster you can text rather than summoning them with a Ouija board. Folklore adapts not only to be communicated and created through new mediums, but also to reflect new mediums and our fears associated with them. Through creepypastas, we can see the internet as this potentially deep, dark, dangerous place that we don't fully understand yet. What is being online all the time, consuming images and videos doing to our minds? Is it changing us? Is it unsettling us in ways that we can't quite articulate? Cause that's like, that's what horror is for. Yeah. Yeah, th yeah, that all checks out. Okay. That's where my brain went, reflecting back on the creepy pastas of my youth in honor of the anatomically inaccurate bone creature season. Sorry, where is my hand? The, se the season. And if you're thinking, Tia, you did not talk nearly enough about Slenderman in this video, that is because I am doing a whole video dedicated to Slenderman. The Strange Jones Halloween special is is Slenderman. We're really celebrating this year. My, my two October videos, I'm gonna make my Halloween costume, which is my like queer punk rendition of Baphomet. I'm gonna show you the construction of that. Um, and then we're gonna talk about Slenderman and run around in the woods at night. It's gonna be great. I will see you then. Thank you so much for watching, my friends.